There we go. Here's the record button. Yahtzee, and we're recording. Let's talk about Lewis structures. Um, so there's a few rules for Lewis structures, and I'm going to just dump them all and cover some of them up with my head here on the screen. Um, but let's do some examples. So everybody's favorite, water. Um, now, you had that one written out. And from all this stuff, um, real fast, real fast version of this to just get everybody caught up is count your valence electrons, valence from your atoms. So hydrogen has one apiece. And then your oxygen is going to have six. And we know that or the oxygen has six because it's in group six on the periodic table. You don't count up the total number of oxygens or electrons. You're only counting up the valence ones. So everything that's a core, we don't care about. So you can really just count up that group number. Um, or I guess it's in group 16, it's depending on how which periodic table you're using. Um, it's, it's got six electrons in it. Um, you just take the, if it's, if you look at it and read it's in group 16, just subtract by 10. Really fun. Um, so then if you do the, uh, dot system, you could draw out one, two, three, four, five. You could draw out your uh, electrons around an oxygen like that. You could draw out an electron around your hydrogens like that. And because this is a covalent species, we say that everything wants an octet. Octet means it's got eight electrons around it, uh, preferred. That's not how you spell preferred. Um, the reason that we say it wants eight electrons is because it gets it to the noble gas valence electron configuration. Um, which is more stable. It's energetically stable. So that's why it wants to be those, that noble gas configuration. Um, it's not because it thinks that uh, neon is cool. It thinks that it's energetically favorable. Um, so to get to eight, you like hydrogen needs to only get to two because it's trying to get to the same configuration as helium. Um, to get there, you need to share electrons. So we could share electrons right here and we could share an electron right here. Um, if we do that, we then get something that looks more like, um, like this. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that it shows that this is being shared between that first hydrogen and that second or that oxygen. And then these are being shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Um, what you're never, I mean, that's not, it's not that you're never, you'll rarely see a structure out like that though. What you're going to see more. Um, and okay. So this is technically your Lewis structure. If we're going by technical definitions, um, if you, what you're going to see most of the time though, is something that looks like this. And this is technically called your Kekulé structure. Um, this is the Kekulé structure is most of the time what people really mean when they say Lewis structures, though. They'll say Lewis structure, and they're going to mean that thing there on the right. Um, but like I'm eighty-one percent certain that that's really a Kekulé structure. If only there was the internet and I had access to it right now. So what you have here in this Kekulé structure is the electrons in your Lewis structure on the left that are in blue are designated by that line. So every line you see counts as one pair of electrons. Um, the green would be these. The yellow around the oxygen are what we are going to call lone pairs. or LPs, I don't ever call it an LPs, but 
I always just say lone pair. It really is not that hard. And for everybody who remembers our classroom, you know that thing that we used to meet in and it was really fun and we got to see each other's faces and some of you stayed awake the whole time. Um, there was, yeah, there was a pair that was hanging up in the front of the classroom. And this is at the time of year where we make the joke that, look, it's a lone pair. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing that's on the right that I've got highlighted more. That's typically what you're going to see um, in chemistry land. The Lewis structure with all those dots can get kind of confusing. Like, um, and I think you had the example of CO2, right? Yeah. So punchline, if we draw that out, okay, well, let's just do it from the top. Carbon's got four because where it is on the periodic table, oxygen has six. There's another oxygen with six. So we got to place a grand total of 16 of these buddies. Um, carbon, okay, so one, two, three, four, oxygen. Uh, we put carbon in the center because it's our most electropositive atom, which is the opposite of an electronegative atom. You usually put the electropositive thing in the center. And you always put hydrogens on the outside. There you go. Um, oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, if you're like a high school chemistry teacher, you're probably getting ready to like crucify me because of the way that I drew the dots on there. Most of the time they say like, draw the dots and you do like one side at a time. And then you go back in and you fill it. It's like, cool, great. I just know the next part of this problem. So I'm skipping that jazz because it's not that crazy helpful. If we pair stuff up because right now carbon only has four, each oxygen has six. So to get to eight, if we form a pairing there, um, now the oxygen on the left would have seven. The oxygen on the right would have seven and the carbon would have a total of six. The other thing that we should note here, oops, Go, oh, what? okay, great. The other thing that we should note is by drawing it out the way that we did, we spent all 16 electrons that we had. There wasn't a way to get to everything having a valence shell um, just by placing electrons. We're going to have to end up sharing electrons. And in this case, because we're not getting to the valency of eight um, by sharing, we got to bump it up to more sharing. So we could share this thing here and we could share like one of these here. So then if we redraw that in that Lewis structure kind of way, then we have Um, and like I said, nobody ever really truly draws it like that. What you would end up with is a thing that I would point out we haven't really covered yet, um, is a lot of times you're going to see these drawn at an angle of 120 degrees. And that's going to be because of this valence shell electron pair repulsion theory that we're going to end up talking about in class punchline is turns out electrons are negatively charged particles they don't want to be near one another they want to be as far away from possible uh from each other as they can be and so then if you consider this as three-dimensional space what's the farthest way they can get from one another well it's 120 degrees apart from one another so that's why we have that angle of 120 degrees this thing here is called a double bond And we can have triple and quadruple bonds. You're not going to see a quadruple bond in this class. You might see a triple bond. Quad in order to have a quadruple bond, you got to have uh, d orbitals um, that are uh, forming that quadruple bond. You're not going to form them with the elements that we're going to be focusing on most of the time. So this thing over here on the right, that Kekulé structure that we all call Lewis structures, that's their preferred way of drawing that out. You had one more. You had O3, two minus or O3 minus? 
It's just O three. It's just O three, really. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so this is ozone. Um, and we're when we draw out the Lewis structure, it's going to make a lot more sense why it's so dangerous then. Um, so we've got three oxygens, three times six, eighteen electrons that got to get placed. Um, most of, you're going to very rarely find cyclic structures. Um, unless you have five or more atoms. So like we could draw this thing up here, right? Where we have this like triangle orientation where somehow we'd get sharing like this, but this is like 120 degree or that's not even a 120 degree angle. Um, we're like at 60 degree angles. Um, punchline is mother nature hates this. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy. She doesn't want it. Um, she'd rather have uh, atoms or atoms when we have. Uh, there we go. Take two. Um, what she would really rather have uh, is the least amount of strain possible. And by having those three atoms like that, we have a lot of strain. So we're not going to do that. That's called sterics. We're going to get the sterics a little bit later, too. If we do the one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, we do the sherry bit, and then we have oxygen. Okay, this one now has eight electrons. That's cool because it's got two from the lone, from each lone pair and it's got two lone pairs. So a total of eight. Uh, the ones on the end though have seven. Um, and the seven electron bit is not cool. So it's like the uh, two, four, six, seven, right? So the octet is not satisfied, which means then we need to do more sherry bits. All right. But it's going to be weird when we start sharing stuff. So here we go. Oops. So if we, oh, look, kids got tomato sauce all over me. Good job. Um, so we've got... So if we took the electron here and we make a bond with it down here, and that means one of our electrons from like here is now going to be used in this bond. So uh, you could think of this one is that one. I know that I drew that upside down. Like it would have been better if I drew drawn that at the same time. But in your head, if you flip it, you'll flip it. I do that so many times. Um, wrong color. There we go. Let's go. Okay, so now the one here has eight. This one, though, now has one, two, uh, three. And then with the bonds, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's too many. Um, so that is not cool. So this is where things start getting nasty because if we do the another similar kind of sharing thing here um, and we try to share like this one with this one we'd end up with um, uh, 
which is cool for the two oxygens on the outside because now they have eight electrons apiece. But this one has 10. And that is bad. Oxygen can't have 10. Oxygen can at most have eight. There's a thing for other atoms that we're going to deal with that are bigger row in uh, row three and down called an expanded octet. Oxygen doesn't have an expanded octet. <laughs> so this is bad. I don't remember what your structure was. Um. Is it the... Why am I guessing? I could, I could just let you talk. It, it had, um, well, it had the three O's and then the double bond in between. And then on top of the outer O's, a bond and a bond. There are two things and two things. And then on one of the sides, it had one. Does that make sense? Nope. Can't you see it? <laughs> Okay, so you had, and let me draw it real fast. Let's turn the, uh, you had that. Okay, that's what you had, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's do our counting real quick. If we do our counting like this, now we end up with a situation where we've got two, four, six, and then the t uh, here we have uh, four more. So this oxygen on out here now has 10. This one has eight, which is good. And this one has eight. So we keep kind of like passing the buck on this thing being all crazy. Let me see if I can do us a solid here real quick because I want to, I don't know if your generation actually remembers this at all. How hard is it to just use the internet? Oh, hey, there you go. Okay, Groovy, here we go. Person with display. I want person with display left. Oh, that's close. There we go. Okay, so there was this thing that like happened in the 80s and some really really bad movies came of it um the depletion of the ozone layer and oh that's funny because this is a green like this part right here where the cursor is going back my computer isn't picking it up because i'm using a green screen that's hilarious um but there's this whole thing where this year the ozone hole over antarctica was far smaller than expected in fact it was the smallest since the ozone hole was discovered the result of unusual weather patterns in the stratosphere over okay great so the ozone layer depletion was a real big issue um, because the ozone layer protects us from uv rays um core fluorocarbons and a lot of stuff that people came up in the 70s and the 80s rapidly depleted it and when we outlawed those things turns out 30 years later um 40 years later things started getting better So ozone is this kind of like really bad molecule um, to have down at atmosphere level. Um, if you've ever seen like the pictures of smog in LA and otherwise, um, there is a thing I'm trying to find here and that was useful. Um, ozone causes bad breathing problems. It's like um, it reacts with like stuff like in plastics like over here and it causes uh, a lot of chemical damage um, it's highly reactive if you've ever been in a uh, gym that was the word gym and a locker room and you've like smelled a really foul smell from like oh uh, like all the bacteria and whatnot that because it never got cleaned out but then you come back like a day later and it smells um differently bad but it doesn't have that bacteria bad smell they probably put an ozone generator in there because ozone generators are really great at like ozone's really great at killing bacteria so a lot of times you will use that legitimately in um, a gym environment that, where you need to kill bacteria 
So it's got its purposes, right? You just don't want to breathe the crap. So what does that got to do with any of the stuff that we've been talking about? And we'll just do it this way. Okay. So here's our structure of ozone. Okay. And then I'll move out of the way here in a second. So when we drew it up, we kept coming up with structures where oxygen had um, 10 electrons around it, right? Nope, that wasn't the right one. There it is. Let's go. Um, we kept drawing structures where we had 10 electrons, and oxygen can't have that. It can have at most eight. What we end up finding out is um, oxygen does this thing where one atom around it is going to have eight. One atom around it is going to have eight. And then one of the atoms, like this one, is going to have more around it. But it doesn't stay that way. It's going to pretty quickly pass that electron density around um, so that, so because we've got two, four, six, eight uh, here, and we have eight here, and we have eight here. Um, so I said that wrong. Let me try that again. Let's go back to my, because I might be able to explain this a little better. Wow, I'm having a hard time today with, there we go. <laughs> like, ha, 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 I do technologies. Okay. We drew this thing right here as our last example. Can't do that. Not legal. We got to get where it's eight. When we first started, we did this. Or actually, when we first started, we did this thing right here. And then we went down to this thing right here. The lower left hand corner down he here. The reason that we said that this was bad was because of that where that red arrow was pointing at that electron because we had nine total electrons there. What we didn't do was just give this oxygen on the far left that single electron. So like if we take, I'm going to erase some stuff just so we can keep it here on the same screen. If we take this and we come back up here, we can say oxygen in the middle with that lone pair, oxygen on the far right with the double bond, Single bond, oxygen, lone pair, lone pair, lone pair, lone pair, lone pair. And this one is still this one down here. But we take this thing, the one that's in red, and we're going to put it right there. Yeah, but here's the bad part. Because <laughs> there's always a bad part, right? So everything's cool now in terms of eight valence electrons. Everything's cool there. There's this thing called formal charge. So here's why... The formal charge bit is bad. Formal charge is going to be equal to basically. All right. This isn't the formal equation, but this is basically what it comes down to. You go from the uh, number of valence electrons from periodic table. 
So in this case, it's oxygen's gonna have six, right? Minus number of electrons on structure. Yeah. I've been watching Why? a lot of Michael Caine, and so my pronunciation for things is now wrong. Um, why is this a thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is a thing because it helps us predict the stability of molecules. Let's go back to water. Water's pretty stable, we would agree, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so if we do the formal charge, and I do call that FC, uh, of hydrogen, we go to the periodic table. It's got one valence electron around it, right? Minus, and then if we go to this structure and we see like, oh, if we do the hydrogen that's on the left, the one that's got the uh, bond in blue highlighter, you could say, oh, it's got two electrons on it. It doesn't. It doesn't. The reason it doesn't have two electrons on it is because it's sharing. So it only gets to count half of that bond towards itself. So one minus one is zero. And a formal charge of zero is indicative, of us, indicative to us that the atom is happy. It's not going to be very reactive. At least we're not going to predict it to be highly reactive. If we do the same formal charge calculation for the other hydrogen, it's going to be zero as well. If we do the formal charge for oxygen from the periodic table, oxygen is in group 16. So it's going to have how many valence electrons? Six. Six. Yeah, and we did that up here too. So six minus the number of electrons that are around our oxygen. So we have two lone pairs because in the yellow for a total of how many electrons? Six. Well, Wait. the yellow is four, but... The yellow is four. <laughs> yeah, the yellow is four, but when we take the blue and the yellow bonds into consideration right over meow. Oh, I can almost touch it. I'm get, my hand's going to disappear. Ah, oh, it's so good. Hand just disappears. It's just like... <laughs> um, six. Six minus six is equal to zero. Because the formal charge on every atom in water is zero, we would predict water to be pretty stable. <laughs> You're like, oh, wow. <laughs> Water's stable. Other news. Run, sun rises in the east. Okay. What about carbon dioxide? No, nah, you're, you're not buying it. No, I'm just, I was looking at the O3 and I'm like, well, wait a second. That isn't. Oh yeah, let's go there. Cause that's even better. <laughs> yeah, it's totally better. I'm just going to redraw it on a fresh page. Um, Yeah, yeah. Okay, so to help you with this, I strongly suggest that you label your oxygens as like oxygen one, two, and three. So then when you go down and do your math, you do your formal charge for oxygen one. So you can, so you can denote all of the formal charges um, in, a, in a couple of ways. This will be the first way. So oxygen is six minus how many electrons does oxygen one have around it? Seven. Seven, that's right. So our formal charge here is negative one. That means that that oxygen is not happy. That oxygen is not happy. It would like to get to zero if at all possible. Okay. How would that be possible? How can it get to zero? I'll show yeah. you. I'll show you. It's really fun. Oxygen 2. It's not that bad. I'm saying it's fun. It's actually not that bad. Right? Like sometimes when I say it's fun, it's really terrible. Here it's like it's a it's fun and it's fine. Okay. Oxygen 2 minus how many electrons does oxygen 2 have around it? 5. Yeah. Okay. If you see two atoms right next to one another and their formal charges are opposite of one another, so like one's a negative and one's a positive, 
bells should be going off in your head. This structure is not stable. If there is a, another way to draw out that structure that follows the rules um, and gives you formal charges that are not opposite of one another, right next to one another, that's a better form. That's a better structure. This is telling you that this is unstable. Formal charge on oxygen three, six minus six, zero. So oxygen three is like, eh, I don't know what the problem is. I'm fine. Um, then oxygen one and two are not having it. It's this whole thing right here, these charges, um, that makes ozone so good at oxidizing things and reacting with things. Um, so what will a lot of times happen, like in the case of that gym locker room example, um, in the locker room, um, you'll turn on the ozone generator, you'll bump in a bunch of ozone. Ozone has this kind of structure and, Anytime it, it attack, anytime it can attach itself onto something like a biological molecule, it's going to react with said biological molecule. It's going to break it down. Um, and it's going to start causing radical reactions. Um, so is that at the end of the reaction, you'll end up with oxygen and, well, some mutated uh, molecule or some mut mutated cell, um, which then usually dies. So that's how most mutations actually work in the world. You don't end up with powers like in the X-Men. Um, so ozone is really awesome at killing things because it wants to rear it wants to react with anything it can it can possibly come into contact with to get all of its stuff to zero, including having a chemical reaction take place so that uh, yeah, you get that. So this is a really good indication of this is molecule not to trifle with. And we know it. It's a mutagen, right? If, like if you breathe it in ozone, it's going to mess your lungs up. This is why. Um, but I told you there's a way for oxygen one to get to zero. Let's do that. All right. So sometimes you're going to have instructors, just BT dubs that instead of drawing out dots, they're going to put little X's for the electrons um, because X's are easier to see on whiteboards or they're going to put like a full-on line and the line is going to represent two electrons. So that's a thing. Okay. Why did we put the double bond between oxygen two and three? Give the middle one eight. What if we put the double bond here and we do this jazz? Just backwards. Yeah, it is backwards, except for this is still oxygen one, this is two, and this is three. Yeah, but then what about three? <laughs> Okay, yeah, now three is like, what the heck? Now three is in a situation where it's got a positive one charge, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so what we have, what we have here is a situation where we need to really think about what this drawing is representing. Okay. What this drawing is representing is a picture for our crude minds to visualize where electrons are or a way to communicate with one another what we think a structure of a molecule is going to be. And it's crude, right? It's way better than drawing like stick people. But it's not as good as drawing out like an electrostatic potential map or an electron density map. But those are really hard. Right. Most of the time we have to have comp computational software to do that. Um, excuse me, especially when you start having more complicated molecules. Something like this sucker, though, down here. Even doing like a basic computations without a computer would take us a long, long time. Super long time. 
what this is called is resonance. And the idea behind resonance is we have two structures that are equally valid and that can exist simultaneously. What does that mean simultaneously? It means the electrons are flowing around this molecule nonstop. There's no reason that the electron that is in uh, green here is really on that oxygen. It's really in an electron cloud that's floating around the entire molecule. That's really what's happening. So this electron that's in green really isn't on oxygen three. We just wrote the, the electrons over there to denote, hey, there's electron density in this place. And that's where like this is a formalism of our like a construct of our minds and not really what's happening um and that's why i'm saying this is kind of cool that electron isn't there it's free floating around the entire molecule and so what we end up with is these two resonance structures here at the bottom that are equally valid so if we took a uh, time-lapse photography photo of this molecule, what we'd really end up with is something that looks, that we would draw and we would say looks like this. And the dotted lines represent, well, sometimes there's a bond here and sometimes there isn't. <laughs> so this bond is sometimes over here and sometimes it's over there. And so then you would put your electrons around uh, the thing as appropriate. So like this is way closer to what's actually happening. So if I just started you out with that picture without going through this... Like, okay. Does that stuff make sense? Yes, it does. Cool. Well, there goes uh, Friday's video. I'm going on break. <laughs> oh my god. Um. So, so other question. Yep. So, relating to. Ozone stuff in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Okay, also linked with the lab. If um, so, like when different types of radiation interact with molecules in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and it doesn't cause activity, then does that mean that those molecules aren't affected, or that they? I'm not doing a good job. I don't know what my no, question is. No, no, no. <laughs> I think, um, okay, so I'm going to talk while I pull up the actual lab. Um, so if we take something like ozone, right, one of the reasons that it's so useful is its bond length. Its bond length is the right length for it to interact with UV radiation. So when we say the ozone layer absorbs UV radiation, what it's really doing is it's interacting. Uh, the UV radiation is act interacting with ozone molecules, causing them to break down into oxygen. And then you have just like this oxygen radical floating around who then it's like, oh, screw this noise and grabs onto another oxygen that's been recently destructed and you reform ozone. So you go back between oxygen, ozone, oxygen, ozone, oxygen, ozone. But, and the UV radiation that's coming from the sun is doing all that work. And so it's getting absorbed up at a higher level um, so that it then isn't blasting us on Earth. If you launched helium uh, up there, helium doesn't have a bond. And it's also, its size is such that it's not going to interact with UV radiation. So like it's not going to do diddly. Um, which lab exactly is it? The molecules in light? Um, yes. Mainly, it was whenever 
They have the simulation to like, put different types of radiation onto the molecules or whatever it was. Um, and then it asked right after that in part three, letter A, <laughs> um, about like what that means in terms of like the ones that you would find in the atmosphere. Okay, like, part three, letter A, this thing right here. Um, Examine how different photons. Right below it. Yeah. Right below it. Uh, yeah. Which okay, is what so. it means in terms of atmospheric stuff. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that is pretty much actually what I talked through. That's hilarious. Good. Thank goodness it's an HTML5 one. Okay. Um, so stuff that's actually in. Okay. Examine how different photons, blah, blah, blah. Which molecules were not affected by any radiation in the sim? Okay. So I don't know. Great. What? Just turn it on. Show lights. Oh, you have to move the love again. <laughs> That makes me angry. Okay, so microwave radiation does nothing. Infrared radiation, nothing. Visible light, nothing. UV, nothing. Great. So nitrogen does diddly. Oxygen, diddly. Same thing. Great. Uh, carbon monoxide. Okay, carbon monoxide works with microwave, which then means it's going to do infrared a little bit, causes it to vibrate. Uh, visible, it's going to do diddly squat. And UV, it's going to do diddly. Carbon dioxide. Really? It should. Hmm, pass it. Yeah, I was gonna say it. I better damn well do infrared radiation. That's what we teach. Um, so that makes it true because we teach it. Ozone, great. Oh, hey, look at what that. What is with that? What? That was that threw me for a loop. <laughs> oh, that's exactly what I was talking about. I wish there was a way to slow it down. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, so. Remember a part where I said that UV radiation hits an ozone molecule and then it causes the ozone molecule to split into oxygen and then like a little radical oxygen floating around? Oh, yeah. That's that literally what it was. Oh, my gosh. I know a thing. It's crazy. And so then it like floats away. But this thing over here doesn't go long before it hits and runs into another oxygen. And then it reforms ozone up in the hopefully up in the right part of the atmosphere, which is awesome because then you have then you have the ability for that uh, newly formed ozone to also get blown to smithereens because when it gets blown to smithereens, it absorbs UV light. So less UV light hits us, which is a good thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Yes, it does. You're just saying that? You're just saying that. No, that makes sense. I, I understand more of what's happening when looking at this simulation. Because I was kind of just oh, writing nitrogen down what dioxide I saw. Oh, does it too. Making it so. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, right. because this is another one of those uh, greenhouse gases. That's not what I wanted. Okay, return. Um, slow down, chief. Seriously, you are the worst. Oh my gosh. Okay, great. So NO2 is another, this is like the brown component. I think it's the brown component in smog. So you have like ozone and you have, uh, what they're usually called NOx gases. So it's NOx, cause it's usually like a random number of oxygens. Um, sometimes it's a random number of nitrogens too. But they, and they, it, I'm pretty sure it's the NO2 that makes the brown component of smog. Um, and this nitrogen dioxide especially is prevalent in incomplete uh, diesel fuel combustion. Um, diesel fuel has a lot more nitrogen in it than gasoline does. So then you end up with nitrogen dioxide, and that's why semis get in trouble in the state of California um, because they use diesel. And you have the same thing happen where... Really? You're going to, like, now not do it? Yeah. 
there it is. <laughs> it absorbs it. And so then you have nitrogen monoxide go float away. And then you have a, a free radical oxygen left over. And free radical oxygen is terrible. It like wreaks havoc. Um, <laughs> it's so bad. That's the thing that does the killing um, <laughs> like with the ozone. Um, I mean, ozone does the killing too. But, um, yeah, free radical oxygen is so bad. That's why um, this is literally the species that they tell you to eat uh, blueberries and other antioxidant foods for. Because sometimes when you eat uh, less good foods, they're, uh, they have more radicals in them. Um, and then this kind of stuff happens in your body. And then you get... Well, most of the time, honestly, what happens, especially if you're a young person, um, most of the time is what happens if you have this like oxygen radical float around, it goes and hurts a cell and then your body says, ha ha, this cell's malfunctioning, time to die cell and it kills it off, right? Um, and then you're fine because it's like one of the gazillion cells that you have. But as you get older um, and your body doesn't work as well, um, see my knees, for example, things like this actually start mattering. Um, and so then when they damage cells, then you start ending up with cancer and stuff. And that's why they say like, eat, you know, plenty of antioxidants like blueberries and tea. It's only certain teas though. Yeah. So other things, uh, is it tomatoes that are good at antioxidants? I think it's tomatoes. Tomatoes are good at some things. I don't know. I hate tomatoes, but I eat them because they're healthy. They're actually healthier if they're cooked. Fun fact. Really? Yeah, tomatoes That's are like one of those weird uh, fruits that uh, if you cook it, it's healthier for you. Yeah. It's like a peen. Like a peen. I feel like it's like a peen. And then when you cook it down, like with, especially like with a tomato sauce, um, it activates easier and it's more readily digestible by your body. Spaghetti sauce time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Sprinkle blueberries on your spaghetti sauce. Mm. Oh, God. That sounds like something one of my kids would eat. I'm going to try it with the youngest one next time I have blueberries. He'll eat it. He eats anything. Like walking garbage disposal. Does that make sense, though, with the um, descriptions? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it is. Cool. Helping people. That's what we like. Making content. Um, last question on the lab, I promise. I don't care. <laughs> I'm here until uh-huh. whenever. Um, on the last part, like the part three of the whole thing. Mm. It's so unfortunate um, that these got named the way they did. Part three and part five. It's unfortunate. I, no, because the one from last week was the most confusing because it kept referencing other parts. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking. It was terrible. Yeah. But it's okay. Yeah, we're um, all scrambling. But the, for that, do I need to do <laughs> the loose structures for that? Because it kind of says. Uh, this was the same model that I used. Oh, it's so cool. All right. Um, do you got to use the same model? Is it saying to draw the Lewis structures, or is it just send you that chart? Predict how it will interact with light based on your observation in the simulation with other molecules. And then Re- that's in addition to drawing Lewis structures. Record your oh. predictions in the table below. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. So. So when you're doing here part five, um, I think it would be really helpful to draw your Lewis structures. If you go back to whoops there, this one, and you note the molecules that interact with the various kinds of radiation, um, specifically take a look at their shape, um, but m- I would tell you more than anything, look at their uh, bonding. 
So if you draw the Lewis structure for carbon monoxide, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone, take note how many oxygen, oxygen single bonds on there, how many oxygen, oxygen double bonds, yada, yada, for all these different things here. Um, because then when you go to this list, you could ask yourself, do I have the same kinds of bonds and what interacted with what in here? So like nitrogen, right? Nitrogen should, well, come on. I don't got time to wait. Um, I got all time in the world. Really? I guess that's true. Nitrogen did not get affected by anything. Yeah. I was like, okay, whatever. So this carbon oxygen bond, mm. in the case when it's a double bond, because it's got the two lines here, um, mm. it's really nice that they made that molecule as small as possible. Um, there seems to be something about the carbon oxygen double bond that allows it to interact with infrared light. So if you go back to here, and if you're able to draw out a structure that has a carbon-oxygen double bond, maybe in the case of formaldehyde, because that's what that is, that's formaldehyde. Can't hint, hint, nudge, nudge hard enough on that one, can I? Literally by, oh, I guess I could literally say there will be a carbon-oxygen double bond there. Um because the hydrogens are going to be off of the carbon and then you're going to have a carbon oxygen double bond. You could say, "Hey, that's a carbon oxygen double bond and the carbon oxygen double bond and carbon dioxide interact with infrared light and visible uh, visible light. No, uh, no, no visible light and no UV light." So you can make some predictions that way. That Why does not visible sense? light do anything? Visible Ever. light? <laughs> yeah. Um because of its wavelength and none of these molecules are colored. Well, actually, this one is colored. This one does stuff. Yeah, remember I said this was brown? So see, like, it gets energized. It's absorbing the visible light, and then it, like, kicks off a photon of light every once in a while. Oh. See, it kicked it off that way. I didn't, I never, I did not notice that one. <laughs> yeah, and so what it's doing here is it's, kick, it's like, absorbing light. Uh, it's absorbing energy. Think back to um, those examples we did with hydrogen and how... Uh, they went from a, when we were doing the Bohr orbit model, or the Bohr model of the atom, and you went from uh, N equals uh, 5 down to N equals 2, and it released a photon of light that was in the visible light spectrum. It released light, right? As, it, as the electron went from higher energy to lower energy, the energy it lost came off in the form of a photon. It did. You can trust me, or you can go back and watch the video. I get those views up. This the same thing happens here. So this molecule absorbs visible light at the right wavelength. In this case, it's saying just visible generic. It looks like it's yellow. Me being nitpicky, I'd probably say make it white, but that might be confusing too. Whatever. I didn't program it. I'm just really thankful it's here. Um it's absorbing a photon of light at the right wavelength. And then it's like, it's in it's like super saiyan one form where it's all like yellow and everything. Um, sorry, Dragon Ball Z joke. The, it's all in this excited state. The electron uh, cloud is going to drop down to a ground state and when it does it's going to lose energy in the form of a photon and there goes that photon that's the one that's like deflected off here to the side so yeah it something that is colored like to the visible eye to the visible eye colored to the eye will interact with visible light that's a really long way to explain that sentence Water's clear and colorless. Carbon dioxide, um, clear and colorless. Oxygen, clear and color. Oxygen's actually blue. Um, nitrogen dioxide's clear and colorless. Carbon monoxide, the silent killer, because it's clear, colorless, and odorless. Um, and ozone smells. 
if you want to go smell some ozone, uh, go print something off of your printer and get your nose down there real good. Um, because like some of that is going to be toner, but it also produces a bunch of ozone whenever you print stuff. It's not going to be enough to like do that much damage to you unless you're like really got your nose down there trying to really do something stupid. Um, but you'll still probably be fine. Stinks. Is that why printer paper stinks? (laughs) Yeah, that's part of it. Yep. That is part of it. Um, really makes you not want to work at Kinko's. Uh, I'm sorry, FedEx now. They dropped the Kinko's part of the brand. Yeah. Oh, that's really fun to click that. Almost everything I would have thought would have interacted with microwaves. I'm glad I got Oh, yeah, see, there it is. Yeah, everything reacts with micro reacts reacts with microwaves because microwaves cause rotational vib- rotational movements in molecules. What's the one that it's nitrogen mm. dioxide? Why hmm? wasn't that one on the lab? That nitrogen one looks dioxide? Fun. Yeah, that wasn't on the That one looks like it's having some fun. Yeah, this thing is just like having a ball. That's part of the reason that's like so bad too. Is it because it interacts with so much stuff? And if you draw out its Lewis structure, you're going to see that it's not a happy structure. (laughs) Like you're going to have formal charges and they're going to be like, and they're going to be angry. Um, They make that noise too. Um, And because they're not happy, uh, like one of the things that we could say is we would predict this molecule to be uh, reactive based off of the Lewis structure and the formal charges on the Lewis structure. So that's like the power of the formal charge thing. It gives you a good indication of how happy a molecule is or is not. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it kind of is, right? I mean, I said it was, but I also say a lot of things. It makes a lot of things make sense. Good. And you can like see how stuff is actually connected. Yeah, this is like the part of chemistry when it actually, like I wasn't kidding when I said like in chapter seven, that's when stuff starts getting fun, like with the quantum stuff, because now we've like observed enough macro level properties uh, to um, to be able to say, okay, here's how quantum and like this atomic structure stuff impacts that macro level property. If you draw out the structure for something like oxygen and something like water, um, you're going to see that water has this really crazy strong dipole moment. And because it has this really crazy strong dipole moment, that's why it sticks together as a liquid. Um, Because the atoms want to hang out with one another because their dipoles are attracted to one another. Whereas something like oxygen, which is way bigger comparatively than water, the molecules are like, oh, no, we're good. We don't want to be near one another. And so they just hang out in the gas phase. And your Lewis structure helps you see that pretty clearly because from your Lewis structure, you can get a real decent idea uh, with respect to um, dipole moments. Yo. Yeah. 